Please take your Bibles to Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. About 11 years ago, uh, this time, it was in the end of May, early June, I went to, for a summer I spent in Belize. It's a Central American country in the Caribbean Sea. And Belize is a unique country for many different reasons. Uh, we went there for, I went there to help build a school and help move the word down there, help speak the word and establish some believers down there and uh, some local believers. It was really a wonderful time. And while we were down there, we lived off, I lived on an island called Ambergris Key. And this island, the reason it was existed is because the second biggest barrier reef in the world is off the coast of Belize. And it protects all these islands from just being washed away by water, by the, the currents of the ocean. And so this, this little island is like a little strip of, of land like this. It's just sand and you know trees grew on it and then people developed on it. About a quarter or half a mile off of the coast of that is the, the Great Barrier Reef. And we had, I, I, this was the view I had every day, was this outside. I had these palm trees and then this is the Barrier Reef, this white thing here. The clouds were always crazy big and then this is a boat going across. And this is like a channel that you could go into Ambergris Key from the open ocean. And all this is seaweed here. All this is seaweed and it's, it's about, it only gets to be about eight feet deep. And one of the believers named Robert, one of the guys that we witnessed to down there, a Belizean guy, he wanted to bless us. He, he was so blessed by the word that we were speaking to him. He wanted to take us out fishing. And so it was me, Robert, and there was two other believers, a couple named Bob and Amy. And we went out on these uh, tandem um, kayaks, and we went out and we went fishing. And he wanted to get these fish and cook them for us, and we went out there. And he found a friend at the, berry, at the reef. Like We went out there, we, he met up with a friend who had a spear gun. Now, a spear gun is like a truck. It's like a pickup truck for them. Like you can do a lot of things with a, with a spear gun. You, can feed, you feed your family with it. It's, it's, uh, you go in, you can get all kind of fish. You can get all kind of things, but you can get lobster with it. Lobster are kind of hard to get if you don't have something to get them. You can't just like, fish for lobster. And so he got this spear gun, and he's like, we're going to make lobster tonight. And, and so what he would do is he would dive down in the seaweed and, and we, would ha we had snorkel masks on and he had these little tiny caves at the bottom of the floor, the sea floor, that, you know, it's only eight feet deep you, at the deepest. Some of it's only four feet deep, so you could walk in it. He would dive down and he would just rustle the, the cave and then he would shoot. And then he, we would get, uh, we got like a lot of lobster that day. So we're on our way back, and I don't know if you've ever been out in the sun all day on a boat without any cover on top of you, and especially as you go southern, closer to the equator, you get, it, it roasts you, you get tired, you just kind of like, all right, let's get back home. So the, the sun is going down, and we, we make our way back to shore, and something happens with the boat Robert and I are on where it, it tips over, it capsizes. And we get back on the boat, we're just so tired, and we, we, you know, you're tired from the sun, but you're also swimming and getting these things, and you're paddling, and we get to shore, and the spear gun is gone. The spear gun has fallen. Somewhere, somewhere around here, the, the spear gun has fallen into the, the sea, into seaweed. And we spent about an hour back, going back out there and trying to find it, and we could not find it. So the sun's going down. There's no way we'll find it in the dark. We go back. He makes these lobster dinner. But he, we do all this research to try to figure out how to get another spear gun because there's just no finding this spear gun. We, did all, we, we tried, and we couldn't find it. So the, the whole rest of the next week, I, I looked into it. And to get, they don't sell that type of spear gun anymore. It's a specific length of spear gun and everything else was like half the length and that specific length allows you to shoot farther and it's kind of like you know somebody giving you uh you know you had a pickup truck and they gave you like you know now you have a el camino or something you know they're like oh yeah and to get that in the states you could buy it and it was like several hundred dollars but to get it you you couldn't bring it into the country without paying an import tax of 
what you paid for in the state. So you're paying double for it. It was just impossible. We could not, we tried to figure out all these ways to get it and we couldn't. And so <clears throat> we had to work that whole week because we had a lot going on. And then that next Sunday, so for an entire week, this thing was gone. And there was also stuff on the boat. There was a couple, I had a knife on that boat. There was a couple of tackle things that were on there. But the big thing was this spear gun. It was irreplaceable. We could, we had to get it. This was another man's livelihood, his friend's livelihood. And so it's like, how do you, you know, it was a big, it was a huge um, problem. It was a huge opportunity. And so I got clear and I got concerned and I prayed and I went out on a, on a Sunday, me and Bob, we went out and I, there was two promises or two things that I prayed and I saw there in the Bible, there was a man of God who some guys were chopping wood and an ax head fell off of the ax and went into some water. And the man of God stuck a stick into the water and pulled out the ax head, which was like, it, you know, which is really crazy. So I had that picture in my mind and then I really prayed. I knew that God could find anything because he found people like us. He found people who were super lost and super in darkness and nobody could find, he found. And so I knew he could find, those, he could find that, he could find that ax head, we could find it. So I went out here and I just, I prayed that God would tell me when to stop, when to stop paddling. And I had this little um, uh, cinder block that I used as an anchor. And I threw the cinder block over when I knew it was time. And like I said, somewhere around here like i don't know where i just knew okay drop the drop the anchor and i jumped out and i swam for about a minute and i saw this knife just sitting there i looked in my goggles and i maybe it was my goggles or maybe it was god i don't know but the knife was this big this this tiny little knife that had spent a week in the caribbean sea was this big and i was like it's there and before i could get out of the water or whatever i grabbed the knife and right next to it was the spear gun. Aww. And I came out of the water screen. I, wanted, I wish they caught that on camera, what the <laughs> yell that I gave, because it was the biggest relief, one of the biggest reliefs of my life to find that. And now this is all rusted open and stuff, so I use it as my letter opener, and it reminds me of God's faithfulness and His willingness and ability to help us. But tonight we're going to be talking about... Um, the value of an individual to God and helping the lost get found. There's things in life that when they get lost, they're just, they're lost forever. You know, there's things where you are seemingly lost forever. But we have, there's many times, many people that I know that they lost something and they found it just like this, a physical thing. But people can be just as lost. People can be lost in the mucky waters of the seaweed of life and with nobody to find them. But God is always looking for people, and He wants to bless and take care of people. So turn to Luke 15. You should be there. In Luke 15, there's three parables in here, and we're just going to look at one of those parables that Jesus Christ talks about. We'll start in Luke chapter 15, verse 1. Then drew near, then drew near unto Him all the publicans and sinners for to hear Him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. You know, the saying, haters going to hate. This, the, the, he was trying to help these people that really needed help. And these religious leaders were saying, oh, gosh, look at the people he's hanging out with. Oh, gosh. So then he says this parable. The, he says a few parables, but we're only looking at this one. And he spake this parable unto them, saying, what man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, does not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after the, that which is lost until he find it? He's asking the question, if you own sheep, how valuable are your sheep to you? If you lose one sheep, are you going to go find it? And the answer is yes. All of these guys, if they own sheep, they would go do that. Sheep had value to them. And find it. And when he has found it, he lay it on his shoulders rejoicing. You know, it's kind of like that spear gun. I was like, oh my God, I held it up. I, I want to hear what I sounded like. I was just yelling as loud as I could. This was incredible. Because I gave it to Robert. He gave it back to the friend. The friend didn't even know anything happened. You know, so that's, that's kind of cool too, you know. Um, found it laying on his shoulders and rejoicing. He re you rejoice when you find that lost sheep. And when he came, when he cometh home, he finds together his friends. Uh, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, "Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost." 
you know, everybody gets excited about this lost sheet that, that this guy found. They know it has value and they know that this meant, meant something to him and it means something to them. And when, when he comes, uh, verse 7, I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repents more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. There's joy in heaven over somebody who gets in, who repents, who changes. Uh, in this book, The Bible Tells Me So by Victor Paul Werewell, the blue book is what we call it. There's uh, the other parable is explained. Uh, there's three parables. There's this one. Then there's the parable of the um, ten pieces of silver. And then there's the parable of the forgiving father. It's called the prodigal son by most, but it's really the parable of the parable of the forgiving father. And I wanted to read something through here. It, it, I highly recommend reading this if you haven't read it or if you haven't read it in a while. It's, it's really great. It explains a lot of stuff that wouldn't really make sense to you about the 10 pieces of silver. But he says, The first step in this ladder of success is for a sinner to repent. Repentance for the unsaved sinners is for the unsaved sinners. Confession is for the saved sinners. God's love and the Father's heart so yearns for the lost one that the church will spend itself unreservedly, leaving nothing undone in order, for, or in order to find the one precious lost jewel. Who is that jewel? Each one of us, if we, if we have not accepted Him. And I think that's a wonderful thing because God wants people to get blessed. God wants people to be saved. That's God's will. But not, it doesn't just end there. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 2. God's will is for a man to be saved, to be born again. And to be born again, it's called born again because first, your first birth is uh, body and soul from your mom. And then when you get born again, when you believe Romans 10, 9, and 10, you get spirit. You're born of God's spirit. You have seed. But the thing that doesn't change is your mind. When you get born again, nothing changes up here. You still have everything that you came into it with when you believed Romans 10, 9, and 10. So there has to be things that go on in your mind. Your mind has to be renewed and has to be changed. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4, it says, Who will have all men, God's will is for all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. There's more than just getting saved. Getting When you're lost and you get found, that's God's will for you to get found and to continue to stay in the light, to not just stay in darkness. Because you can be born again, you can have God's Spirit, but live like you weren't. Still walk around lost. Turn to Ephesians chapter 2 and we'll see the state that we were in. The state that we were in when we needed a Savior and what God did for us to bring us into, uh, bring us into the light and to find us. I wanted to say this too. I, I named this teaching the value of the value of an individual to God. There's a lot to think about when Jesus Christ in Jesus Christ's earthly ministry when he went out and just the individuals that he talked to. There was multitudes. There was a lot where he was helping a lot of people, but there's times where he was just only helping one individual, one person, and it was worth it. It was worth it to him to spend this. He he only had a, a limited amount of time, and he still spent intimate time with individuals. I'm not going to list them, but think about the, the people that he did. It's a really amazing thing to think about. In Ephesians chapter 2, we'll start in verse 1, and it says, And you hath he quickened or made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. You were dead. At one point we were dead. Spiritually we were dead. We were not alive. We were dead. Wherein in times past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. There's all these courses that the adversary has laid out in the world, and you're not immune to any of them when you're not born again. You're just walking according to all these different courses of the world that are designed by the adversary, and none of them lead anywhere good. They all lead to, to mainly vanity and just emptiness, you know, the emptiness that you don't have when you don't have God. Among whom we also, we all had our conversation or our manner of living, the way that we lived our life. We were also like that 
in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. We weren't in a good spot. We were lost. But God, verse 4, but God who is rich in mercy for his little love, no. for his small love, no. for his love. No, it says no. great love, for his great love wherewith he loved us. Even when, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins. So it wasn't when we were good or good enough. It was when we needed a Savior, when we needed somebody to love us. That's when he loved us. Not when we were alive and away from sin and had all the things that God had for us. Then, we could, then he would love us. He loved us first. And we needed that mercy. We needed that, that love. And dead in sins, he has quickened us together with Christ. By grace you are saved. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the, so he's not only are we raised from the dead, but we're seated together with Christ in the heavenlies. We're, we, are, we have a different standing now. We have a different thing going on than what, what was going on in verses 1 through 4. Or one through three. For by grace are you saved through faith that not of yourselves, verse eight, it is a gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. It's by grace. It's by grace that we have what we have. Take your Bibles and turn to 1 Corinthians 3. So what happens when you get born again, God, the responsibility of a believer is to grow, is to develop and mature. And as you get mature, then the responsibility is to go Tell it to other people. Keep spreading it and telling it and following the design that God gave. It's, God uses a lot of uh, things that are tangible. Things like sheep, things like pieces of silver, things like plants. Plant life is a huge one that God uses for the Word of God and for people's growth. And we'll see that in 1 Corinthians 3. In verse 6 it says, Paul by revelation is speaking. He says, I have planted... Apollos watered, but who gave the increase? God gave the increase. Somebody's job is to speak the word. He planted the word to water. Somebody's job is to help, to succor that. It's not just God's will for people to be saved, but to come unto the knowledge of the truth. And that takes a lot of work. Anybody who's ever done it, anybody who's ever learned the word, it takes work. It takes patience. Uh, as we might get into the, when it gets to good ground, to be good ground to receive the word, patience is one of the key things you need. Verse 7, So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that gives the increase. Really the focus is on God. It's not like, look at me for speaking the word to this person, or look at me how much work I had to do. You see God give the increase, and God gets the glory. That's the beautiful part about finding people that are lost. And finding that individual and speaking the word to them and teaching the word to them and building the word in their mind. Because once you get born again, you can still live like you were not. You can still live your perfect spiritually. You have everything that Christ made available, but you do not know it and therefore you do not, you, you can't manifest it. And that's where it comes to the, the build, learning that stuff and being in those positions and what God will do to teach one person, to teach one person. The individual, how important that is. He'll put, he puts you in a family, and that family is designed to, if you look at a family, you have the first, you know, you have the parents, and they help, and then, you know, they rear the child, and they teach the child, and then you have another child, and then that brother is able to help with that one, and, and sucker them, and help them, and teach them things. And that's how the family works. Together we work, and together we help people. We plant, we water. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, the working together, and every man shall receive his own, uh, his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God. Laborers together with God. We're able to work together with God. This is something we can do with God. That God's like, hey, I'm working. I got this job I need you to do. I need you to help me with. And that's to speak the word and to help people, to build the word in people's lives. To plant and to water. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Once you get born again, there is a, a huge responsibility. 
it's a great privilege, but it's a responsibility to learn the word, to grow. You know, uh, uh, we, we have a couple children in our fellowship. One of them is two years old. One of them is four years old. And the four-year-old's kind of mad that the two-year-old's now the youngest in the, in the fellowship. But wouldn't it be bad if he was still acting like the two-year-old? You know, you need growth. You, you want him to be, pretty soon you won't be the youngest. And then that youngest won't be the youngest anymore because there's new growth. There's new babies coming. There's people having babies. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, it shows our responsibility. We have a great honor and privilege and responsibility. It says in verse 18, And all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by or through Jesus Christ, and hath given unto us, given unto us the ministry of reconciliation. Now to reconcile is to bring back something that has been separated. Like if a power line gets knocked out, you know it because everything turns off. All your power is gone, and then the guys go out there and they fix it and they reconcile that power, and then you have it back. That's what happened to us. That's what Jesus Christ did. He made available the connection with God again. He made it available for us, and then for us to, to show that you can be connected back to God. To wit, God was in Christ, verse 19, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. It's the word that really, that's, that's what we've been given to, to bring people back. We've been given this responsibility, but we've also given the power to, to use it. And that's, that comes from knowing the word. The word is what does that. The word of reconciliation. And notice it says, Jesus Christ not imputing our tresp their trespasses unto them. Jesus Christ was hanging out with the people who nobody wanted to hang out with, that you shouldn't be hanging out with, but they wanted help. They needed help. They knew that they, they needed help. They knew that they needed a Savior. And He was there to help them. He wasn't pointing out all the stuff that they messed up on and the, the, you know, the terrible years that they had before or whatever. He just didn't care about where they were before. They want, he wanted to know where they wanted to go from there. Verse 20, Now then you are, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead be reconciled to God. So when Jesus Christ was on earth, his job was to speak God's word and to help people, especially those people that were you know, the down and outers of his time and, and help those people who really wanted help. He didn't go to all the people that he didn't beg people to believe God. He didn't like, oh, please come to fellowship. Please do this. He was just there and people came to him and people got results when they came to him. When they obeyed what he said and they heard the word he did, they got, they got results. But he's not here anymore. Jesus Christ does not live on the earth anymore. And that responsibility has been handed off to every believer. We have that responsibility and that privilege, which is really wonderful, to help the lost get found. We have that responsibility and privilege. We don't, we just, all we do is speak it. We go out and you speak the word, you find one promise that you believe, and you can talk about that your entire life, just one promise. As you believe one, you'll believe more, and then you'll be able to talk about more. But if you see one promise in your life, come to pass, you can talk about it your whole life. This, the, the uh, spear gun thing, that, that solidified something in my mind. There's still people to this day that call me when they lose something because I was like, I know God can find it. Uh, Dianora is one that if she listens to this, she'll get a kick. There's times where she'll call me. She goes, I lost this flash drive that had like my final paper on it. And like, I, you know, and I just said, all right, let's pray about it. And she, we prayed and she went right outside and it was in the snow right under some, it was like in, in the snowbank. I was like, all right, there it is. And she was able to find it. And those are things where as you learn God's promises and learn what God, that God cares about you and learn what God has done for you, then you're able to go out and talk about that to people. And people will get turned on. People will want what you have. Some people won't, but that's not our job. Our job is to sow the seeds. So turn to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10 gives some, sheds some light on some of this. So one of the keys, I think, that is so vital to just living in this world, Jesus Christ in here, he's training his uh, 
disciples to go out and to speak the word and to cast out devils, do all these this wonderful things. And he says in chapter 10, Matthew 10, verse 16, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. And it's still like that today. We go out into this world and people will devour you. Things will devour you. Situations are, are harsh and there's no room for grace. There's no room for mercy in the world, it seems. It seems like it's even getting worse and worse th that way. Uh, everybody can film you and then now they have evidence that, you know, of, of all the stuff that you've done or haven't done or whatever. But I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Sheep, uh, we just came from a sheep farm and wolves, coyotes, dogs, and wolves will come in and just, they, a sheep has no, no, um, they're gone. Like once a coyote, a wolf, or, or a, a dog comes into a, a sheep fold, if there's no uh, sheep dog or no, we had a, a donkey and, or no whatever, they don't see it, those sheep, whatever sheep that gets a hold of, they're gone. Um, their dinner for the for that animal but we can be wise as serpents and harmless as doves as we go out into this world and the wisdom of God is really what we need to not only know the word but know how to accurately apply it in our lives that's an amazing thing that we can go out into this world wise as serpents and harmless as doves uh, turn to turn to Proverbs chapter well, actually, turn to John chapter 10. We'll turn to John chapter 10. This is a, a whole teaching on Jesus Christ talking about, I am the good shepherd and, and all these things that he does for his sheep and all these things that he's willing to do. It's, it's a really incredible, uh, the whole chapter is really great. I, I recommend reading it, but we're just going to look at one verse. In verse 27 he says, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I've asked people before, like, I like asking people, what got you turned on to God? Like, what got you in the Word? What is the thing that got your attention? What are the things? Some people, it's the love of God. When I heard speaking in tongues done rightly, when I uh, saw the Word fit, when, you know, there's many different things. But my sheep hear my voice. When I heard the word, I knew it was the word of God. I, I, I don't know. I can't explain it. I wasn't duped into it. I wasn't swindled into it. I didn't, somebody didn't say, oh, you need to. I just knew. Like when I heard Jesus Christ's voice, when I heard the word of God, I knew this was it. This was it. This was God's word. And when you go out and speak, there are people who are just waiting to hear that. When you live on a sheep farm, a lot of times, at least the, the shepherds that I know, they whistle. And you can go along the, the you can go in the farm and you can whistle the same exact tune and they will not come to you. But if you whistle, if the, the shepherd whistles, they go, hey, that's the shepherd. And they all run to the shepherd because my sheep hear my voice. It's a really amazing um, truth there. Especially when you're out speaking the word, because sometimes you get discouraged. You're like, how come nobody's hearing this? Nobody's listening, nobody, whatever. But we we all have. We all heard the word and we believed it. And that's why we're here. Uh, turn to Luke. Uh, we'll close here in Luke chapter 8. There's, there's three different uh, records of the parable of the sower. We'll look at Luke chapter 8 in closing. And we'll see the, the principles of having a, a good ground. You can read through uh, Luke chapter 8. It's a great parable, great, a lot of great lessons in here. But in verse, there's different grounds that receive the word. But we want the good ground, and we want to be the good ground. And the good ground is, but, but that on good ground, in verse 15, are they which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it, and bring forth fruit with patience. Those are the keys that are needed to receive and to, and to bring forth fruit. And I'm going to close with a, a little snippet from this book, the Green Book, The New Dynamic Church by Dr. Werewolf. And it's in the chapter, The Believer's Responsibility. Think of the privilege that is ours even to reach one person in a lifetime with the gospel of light. The person we reach may be a key person in a community or in a whole area. The, the, <clears throat> the person you reach for Christ may be the one person who will in turn win hundreds of thousands. 
Someone once witnessed to, the, to and won the great religious saints of all time. Yes, someone who is holding forth the word of life. It is the believer's opportunity and responsibility to hold forth the word in a crooked and perverse world.